All right, we're on page number 96. Page number 96. Uh, we made it to point number four at the top of the page, and of course we're dealing with matters here relative to how to follow divine instruction as to how to overcome the problems that come our way if we are impatient. And uh, of course this is, is all of these, it, it's almost as if each time... Well, you're asking for something I ain't got. Sorry. Well, that's okay. That's okay. I'll, I'll just live so I probably can't say it anyway. Page number 90, 96. And, of course, there's a whole lot of different things that would cause us to become impatient, and that's what this is uh, dealing with. And, and uh, more often than not, when we find a specific instruction as to something that we're to avoid or something that we're to add to our character, then we have numerous examples throughout the Bible of individuals who fail miserably, and, of course, we don't follow their bad example, but they're also evenly balanced sometimes and sometimes not of those who face some of the exact same things we do and they did it in flying colors. So reckon which example we're supposed to follow. Those that received the commendation from God or those who were condemned because of what they did. Well, obviously what was commended is the example we're to follow, which proves, obviously, that it's possible to live faithful in spite of problems that arise in life. And what goes along with living here upon this earth is of second nature problems. You know, Life has got its fair share of good things, but it's also got a fair share of not so good things, things that are not enjoyable, situations that arise that test us, that try us, that cause us to question they even bring us to the point of doubt, which we've talked about in this series. And so if we s simply get a pretty good hold of what the Bible says by way of instruction and following the examples of those that did good, then we know it can be done. Let's just simply follow these examples. doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. Nobody ever said that. It doesn't mean that it won't take effort on our part, that we can just fly through and not ever have to think about it or that we'll ever hit a brick wall, it seems as though no way to get through it because sometimes those things do happen. But if we follow God's instruction, then we can handle it with his help. And without God's instruction, we're doomed anyhow. <laughs> you know, if, we don't, if we're not open and receptive to what the Lord says about getting through matters like this, then there's no man going to be able to help us. You know, we pointed out before how that there are some people that are looked upon as authorities in the area of uh, family relationships and uh, how to succeed in life and all this kind of stuff. And we point out in each and every instance, if they were to point to something that is actually beneficial to us, whatever area it is, then rest assured the Bible had already told us that before they did. And sadly, more often than not, their so-called assistance is not assistance at all, but is actually taking us away from what the Bible would have us to do. I just, uh, it's just uh, mind boggling as to the deviations that mankind oftentimes takes in regards to what ought to be done and, uh, and then the choices that are available for them to make and they make the wrong choice, you know. I mean, we've had, uh, over these last few weeks, we've had our fair share of, of uh, deaths and uh, those that are young, those that are old, those are in between, you know. And uh, yet, on a daily basis, there are people who have no respect for human life, whether it be young or old, and the decisions that they make, oftentimes with the applause of society, is simply despicable. Uh, just, uh, of course, we know the, the triplets and, and how the two of those uh, young babies uh, ended up dying. Well, I just saw today where this couple was having difficulty uh, having a child, and so they went to a doctor and did the fertility thing, you know, and ends up 
the mother has four. Well, now she's got four and she's made the decision she's going to go ahead and kill two of them, legally, of course. And uh, the preference, of course, is to have a boy and a girl. Okay. And so they can dispense with the others. Now, a few years ago, that would be unthinkable. Now that's par for the course. You know, it's going to get to the point where, say, you're a, uh, you don't have the same hair color nor the same eye color as your spouse does. Then you make a determination as to what color of hair you, and what color of eyes your baby is going to have. And if it doesn't turn out that way, then selectively you can just try again with another baby later on. And that's already happening in regards to the choice of sex and selection. Now, they don't surprise us in a communist country like China that that happens. But when it happens in the good old United States of America, the home of the free and the land of the brave, then it should cause us to shudder and to wonder how much longer the Lord will allow such ungodly destroying of human life to go on without punishment from a temporal nature. We need to be on the right side of that issue. And if a person were to be so bold as to raise a voice in opposition to that kind of stuff, then there are those even left-leaning brethren of ours who'd say, well, you've done quit preaching the gospel and going to meddling in politics. Hogwash. Hogwash. If, if the, the sanctity of human life is not directly connected to the gospel, then somebody needs to help me figure out how that it's not. Obviously it is. And so uh, people with their own agenda, and it's not the agenda of God, then they need to get with God on the matter, and then we'll have a meeting of the minds. But it's got to be based upon an objective standard. And the only objective standard that man has, of course, is God's inspired word. So number four says, we need to be patient right in the face of persecution. Remember at the end of the uh, Beatitudes, the last Beatitude in Matthew chapter 5, being at verse 10, Jesus says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And that's a whole lot of stuff there in those three little verses. But it's clear as to what the Lord's talking about. If... You are persecuted because you're simply trying to do what's right, then you're in a very good club because that's the way it's always been. The faithful of God have always been in a very noticeable minority, but they've always been with God. That's by virtue of the fact that they're faithful to God. And so instead of allowing persecution to cause us to turn our back, on what we're supposed to be doing. It should cause us to be more resolved and determined to do what God expects us to do in spite of the fact that we're treated uh, contemptibly by those who, in fact, are serving the God of this world, and that's Satan himself for sure. So you're in good company if you suffer for being a Christian, if you suffer for living righteously, if you suffer because you're standing up and being counted for what's right, if you're opposing the slaughter of unborn children by way of abortion, if you're, if you're standing opposed to gay marriages, and uh, uh, did anybody hear recently that we've got these, these young punk singers now that's decided to get into the political arena like, uh, 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 and start beating the drum for the LBGYKMOZ, whatever, it, all that stuff is. Uh, that's the girl, big old tall blonde head girl from Nashville that's made a zillion dollars. What's her name? Taylor Swift, yeah, Taylor has waded right into it. She's become the mouth for the LBGY, all them other initials, things, you know. I hope she goes the way of the Dixie Chicks a few years ago as well. People quit listen to her, her music and don't let her get on the radio. And uh, red-blooded Americans say, I ain't buying no more of that garbage. I don't care how pretty she sings. I'm not supporting that left-leaning mess that she's promoting. And when... And that's, it did a number on the Dixie Chicks, I promise you that, you know. They went from the very top to the very bottom because at that time, at least, and that's probably 15 years ago or 20, that time the country music audience was more red-blooded Americans than maybe they are now, but uh, who knows, who knows. In spite of the fact that we may be persecuted for righteousness' sake, then we still have to be faithful. 
Man, that's hard, you know. It's hard to do the right thing in and of itself, but when you're doing the right thing and you're treated in a bad way because you are, then that makes it even more difficult. You know? If you're not treated anyway, if you're sort of just uh, avoided and uh, people uh, do not even recognize that you're present, that's one thing. But when you are, in fact, uh, uh, stood against by those who are seeking to promote their own agenda, which is the devil's agenda, then we have to be patient and endure those types of persecution. And that bleeds right into the next one. Number five, we need to be patient in trials. In trials, James chapter 1. There is a blessing that goes along with facing the trials of life and doing it in flying colors. You know, it leads to all types of benefits, to the endurance that's only going to be possible if you go through these difficulties and you do it with the right, in the right way. And, of course, the example that's given throughout the Bible has to do with something that the only way we know anything about it is maybe watching it, watching a, a television show or something about it, or how you get the impurities out of uh, precious metals. You throw the heat to it. And the hotter the heat, the quicker the impurities in the metal melts off you know the hotter the heat the more refined the silver or the gold becomes and that's the example that the bible uses to describe a christian facing trials and tribulation he's becoming more refined the bad is being melted off you know uh, not not physically you know i don't mean you're getting skinnier and skinnier just because you're facing trials, although that sometimes does happen, you know, uh, an inability to eat, uh, staying up at night, not getting good sleep because you're facing those kind of problems. But the patience that we must face in trials will lead to that very same removal of imperfections in our faith, as uh, Wendell says in this particular uh, section. Number six, we've got to be patient regarding church growth. What does that mean? I mean patient regarding church growth. While we wish it was the case that all a person needed to do was hear the gospel one time and then they would fall all over themselves trying to respond favorably to the gospel, that's just not the way it generally happens. It doesn't happen, you know. Uh, sometimes it takes years and years and years and years. So we have to be patient with what we're en engaged in doing because it's our responsibility, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, to sow the seed and to water the seed, but it's who that gives increase. It's God that gives increase. So if we simply do our job, we can be faithful in our job and not step over into the realm of God's job of giving the increase. If we do our job of preaching the gospel, living the gospel before our fellow man, you know, we hear it in our prayers all the time, and properly so, you know, may it be the case that people, when they look at us, they see Christ living in us. Well, is that just something sounds pretty good to say in the prior? Or is that reality? You know, is that really what we want people to see? Here's an individual who's different. Why is he different? Is he just different because he wants to be different? Or is he different because he's following Christ and that sticks out in the world in which we live? Well, it should be the latter, see. Just to be, being different, just to be different is not the idea, obviously. But if we are what Christ would have us to be, if we are truly following in his footsteps, if we are trying to have the same attitude that he possessed, facing the difficulties that he faced the way that he did, then that is going to be noticeable. You know, people are going to see that. Now, we have to be careful also in that, and I've used this illustration before, sometimes a person will say, as they observe somebody that claims to be a Christian, okay? They'll say, well, if that's what a Christian is, I don't have anything to do with it. Well, now, there's not really anything that we can draw definitively out of that statement if we don't know what it is they're talking about in that person. It may be, it may be that they ain't got a clue what genuine Christianity is, and when they see the genuine article being demonstrated before them, they don't have anything to do with genuine Christianity. That could be the case. Or 
they may, they may have a good idea of what Christianity is, and then there is such a divergence between what they know the Bible teaches about Christianity and what is being on public display by this individual that their, their argument holds, holds water. See? So you have to figure out what it is, you know. Uh, I mean, have you ever heard anybody say, well, I wouldn't have anything to do with the congregation that practiced church discipline. Well, you don't have anything to do with, with primitive New Testament Christianity then, do you? Well, glad, glad you let it be known right up front that you don't go along with what the Bible says about withdrawing from the disorderly then. You know? Now, most people, most brethren know enough not to come right out and say that. But by their actions, they deceive them. They deceive uh, most people in that they're right there with the Bible, when it, except when it comes to carrying through on what the Bible says relative to church discipline. Then they show a lack of appreciation for what the Bible says we're to do in that regard. And sadly, you know, that's not uh, an obscure example. Every now and then, that's one that is rampant in uh, most areas, for sure. Uh, could you, would it be right, would it be accurate to say that congregations practice, practicing church discipline are few and far between? Obviously, you know, obviously. Uh, is the practice of church discipline, is it a command that is a uh, uh, subjective thing? You can take it or leave it. Well, is the command to be baptized for the mission of your sins a take it or leave it proposition? Can you like it or not like it? Can you go along with it or not go along with it? Yeah. So consistency is not uh, taken in consideration by those who would oppose what the Bible says about anything, for sure. And there has to be patience in regard to church growth. I mean, think about it from this standpoint. You hear we've been putting articles in the paper and the Tribune, the shopper, for 20 years. Uh, we could say, well, since there is no noticeable results from those articles in Tribune the Shopper, then I think we'd be best not to be putting them in there anymore because there's, it's not cost effective, you know. Well, same thing holds true for just about anything we do. I mean, uh, when's the last time somebody actually obeyed the gospel here and we, were, we observed it happening after a sermon was preached? Well, I think we do a way of preaching too. I mean, won't we just go home? What's the use? You see, that's putting ourselves into the position where God's supposed to be. We keep doing what we're supposed to do, and God will honor our efforts. Uh, how many people were converted by the preaching of Noah over the 120 years while the ark was prepared? I don't know anybody, unless it was them daughters-in-law, you know. But I'm pretty well sure that they were going to be faithful regardless. So... We, we got to be willing to actually look at things through the eyes that Jesus would look at things, and then we'll be uh, less inclined to beat our head against the wall or uh, stick our fist through the wall or uh, gripe and complain because it's not happening like we wished it would. We wish numerical growth would come. Let me tell you something, friends and brethren. I'd rather have 10 faithful members within the congregation I'm a member of than 10,000 that ain't faithful. Ten or five, when we get into the same bartering method that uh, that Abraham did with God over Sodom, but uh, he couldn't find five righteous souls in all of Sodom. Exactly. Exactly. I remember old uh, Ron Gilbert, uh, the older Ron from out here at Spencer, that uh, <clears throat> goes to Africa all the time. You know, he wrote an article one time about the new banana split ministry that he had read about in a bulletin, yeah. And uh, it was not something made up either. 
I mean, here was a banana split ministry. Now, can you imagine? Banana split. And there's a ministry surrounding that. I guess you've got to be good at slicing bananas. You've got to know all the various things that go on a banana split, you know. Uh, <clears throat> I guess you've got to figure out whether somebody's allergic to peanuts before you put peanuts on a banana split. I don't know. But can you imagine a first century situation in which that mentality would have existed? There ain't no way. Yeah, the cowboy shirt. I actually, I, I never seen this before, but on uh, Sunday, it was either sometime Sunday, uh, there was a television program on that said it was a cowboy church. And, and here's their rationale. Here was this guy, you know, he looked like a, uh, he wished he was Roy Rogers or something, you know, and, and he had his sidekick there, Dale Evans, you know, and and he said, you know, the reason why that we need cowboy churches all over the United States is because when I start thinking about heaven, I just couldn't imagine having heaven with people like us not being a part. And, of course, he was talking about people, I guess, you know, that rode tractors a lot and maybe had horses, you know, and, and maybe like to spend a lot of time outdoors. Maybe that went along with their job. He, he just couldn't visualize heaven without the kind of people that are members of the cowboy church. Well, I mean, you can apply that to just about everything. I just couldn't imagine having, uh, having heaven without Green Bay Packer fans there. I just couldn't imagine. So I think we need to have a Packer church. Packer church. And I guarantee you have just many people. I guarantee you have more people. Packer church than you have cowboy church. You have green and gold. Everything you know is green and gold. You know, you have... You can have pictures of Bart Starr and uh, Ray Nitschke, you know, and, of course, if you have a, a, a people named Lombardi, you know, it would be the preachers and stuff. That would really draw the crowds in, too, you know. How silly. thing is, who arrives safely in heaven is not determined by some goofy guy who likes to ride horses saying, I want people that ride horses in heaven. It's determined by who accepts and obeys the gospel. Now, if he happens to ride a horse, well and good. But if he never even knows what a horse is, that's all right too, you see. Trying to make room in heaven for all different types of people is the opposite of the design of the gospel. The gospel design is male and female, Jew and Gentile, all over the world. Same gospel plan for everybody. And that's since the very beginning of the gospel in Acts chapter 2. Now, is that, a, uh, is that a selective group? Well, you better believe it is. But the fact of the matter is, by way of prophecy, all the way back to Daniel chapter 2 and Isaiah chapter 2, all nations would flow unto it. That is the church. All nations, including people that had a background on riding horses or bulls or whatever, and those that had a background riding bulldozers. And those that didn't even know what a bulldozer was, those that didn't even have a... Uh, Combust, uh, internal combustion engine that only rode, rode horses before there was such a thing as a car. Those people too. And the, the common denominator of them all was the realization they was lost and there wasn't but one gospel plan that would save them and God loved man to the extent that he sent his son to this world to live and to die for lost mankind. And if a person won't accept and obey that plan, then it don't matter what he does for a living or what he does on his, in his free time, he's lost. And how in the world it's got to the point where it is now? Let me mark it down. The greatest thing the devil has going today is denominationalism, including cowboy churches. Because people are pacified and satisfied with something other than the truth. And while they might feel fine about themselves, they're lost. Do what? It'd be packed. Oh, yeah. It'd be packed. It's easy to have uh, their lives afterwards in front of their kids and all things, but they never do the communion or the breaking of the bread. They do not do that. Well, usually, if we're going to have communion, they will say, we're going to have communion this coming time on horseback, and that will bring in the crowd, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very similar to uh, a few years ago. There was a, uh, it had been a, a, a 
Outdoor theater, what do you call them things down there that Levon had? Drive-in, drive-in theater, okay. There was one down there in, in uh, Orlando, okay. And what they did is they designed that where you didn't have to get out of the car, you could set the speaker in your window, you know, and you could listen to a sermon, you know. And, uh, and I guess if you liked the point the preacher made in the sermon, you honked your horn or I don't know. Well, then they got to realizing, you know, that that was still too much like regular church, and so they had to go to a different, a different method. And so it became something like a, a drive-through ATM, and you could, and there were a bunch of different stalls that you could go through, and of course you didn't have to wait in line near as long to get your car washed down here, down here at Sharon's place. But, uh, but you could, if you wanted a short sermon then you could have a short sermon. If you want a longer sermon, you could, you could choose your, your selection of songs that could be sung to you, you know. And then you wouldn't get your Lord's Supper, though, until you made a contribution. And that was just what some people wanted, you know. In a matter of five minutes, you had all the acts of worship, and you went on your merry way to Disney World, and you feel fine about yourself, but for no truthful reason. See, now the first time I suggested that, there were a lot of brethren who said, boy, we need something like that around here. Yeah, you give people what they want, and they end up getting what they didn't intend to get later on, sadly, so many times. Pitiful, pitiful indeed. Um, so we have to be patient in regards to church growth. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, sometimes when you look at in Acts chapter 2 and you say, here's one gospel sermon. And here's 3,000 people that obeyed one gospel sermon, but they overlooked the fact that after they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, many brethren, what shall we do? And Peter responded, repent, be baptized, everyone be in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sin. He continued to speak unto them. He said with many other words, he testified and exhorted them. So those many other words, we don't know what they were, but we do know that they who gladly received his word, were baptized. And there were added to them that they had about 3,000 souls. And of course, we would call those people assembled as Jews in the city of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost as sort of the cream of the crop too. But when you think of 3,000 out of a million, that's still a small number. You know. And while there are thousands added only a few chapters later, comparatively speaking to the vast numbers of Jews that were there in Jerusalem, it's still a small number. But yet they were cognizant enough of their responsibility. And if they'd been paying attention, and no doubt many of them were, as, as Paul, or excuse me, as Peter and the rest of the apostles' sermon is 60% quotations from the Old Testament. So if they know anything about the Old Testament, and they're supposed to, then what he's telling them is something they already know anyhow. And it says, this fellow that you crucified, that was the Son of God. That was the very one that God sent to this world to die for lost mankind. And you went and crucified him, of all things. Well, that's one of the reasons why they said, what shall we do? We're guilty of murdering the very Son of God. And, uh, of course, that is a, a, a message that is out of whack with what some people want by way of religion today. They don't want that feeling of guilt. They don't want that blood, and they don't want any of that kind of stuff, you know. And so they don't want rid of the gospel because you've got to have guilt and you've got to have blood and you ain't got no gospel. It goes right along with it. All right, number seven. We need to be patient regarding the coming of the Lord and the receiving of our heavenly inheritance. In other words, while we are to be on the ready at all times for the Lord's return, then we don't want to act as if we are Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19 say, Lord, go ahead and take me now. Ain't no reason for me to continue on, you know. No, we have to be patient. The Lord will come. This world will come to a screeching halt. When? We don't know. We don't know. But we stand, we're supposed to be standing ready and waiting on that to occur, regardless of whether it is in our lifetime or after our lifetime is over. And, of course, that's, that's, the re that's the concept of hope, you know. Desire coupled with expectation, the hope of heaven. Uh, 
And we don't always get what we'd rather do. You know, that's not, that's not the way it works. If we had our druthers, a whole lot of things might be different than they end up being. Paul said it'd be a whole lot better for me if I could go ahead and go, go to the Lord, you know. But it'd be better for you, brethren, if I hung around here for a little while longer. And so as he was in this strait betwixt two, you know, he was confident, and yet he was also uh, contented in whatever situation it was, at, it, it was in, you know. Now, contentment in the face of you're fixing to lose your head for the cause of Christ might be a stretch on the contentment that we might naturally expect, but... That's exactly what he meant when he said he'd learn in whatever state he is in to be content. He really didn't mean that. But it's not something that he was born with. It's something that he developed over time, <clears throat> for sure. If you know what it's like floating around out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, then you might feel somewhat better when you're, uh, you're actually in a prison. You're not floating around out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. It could be worse than floating around. It could be worse than it being in a prison cell, you know. Uh, you could be floating around in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, number eight, we need to be patient in our prayer lives. Now, uh, of course, God always answers prayer. That doesn't mean that God always answers prayer in the time frame that we expect him to, nor giving us what we desire. Sometimes God answers our prayers with a flat-out no. Sometimes he gives us something different than we ask for. Sometimes he answers in the affirmative. But we need to, be, we need to make sure uh, there's a statement that's made here. I should have marked it. But we need to make sure that we are praying our prayers and not simply saying words in a prayer. Uh, well, I don't see that right now. But I know that concept is in there because I read it, read it earlier. There's a difference between praying a prayer and simply saying words at the time we're supposed to be praying. You know, praying a prayer is actually willingness on our part to do what we're supposed to do to bring that end result about you know it's some i've heard it said you know you got to put feet on your prayers you know you don't pray for the for the lost to be saved and not do anything to save the lost that's uh that's saying words that's not praying a prayer you don't uh you, you've got to actually actively involve yourself in doing what the lord wants you to do and then wait on the lord to bring that about uh, yes, ma'am. That's number three on the next page. Well, why did they put it over there? Because that's where it goes. All right. All right, number nine. We need to be patient <clears throat> with others in general. Now, there again, that's, that's an easy thing to say. But I've noticed that it's a whole lot easier to do these things with people you, ain't got, you don't even know if it's somebody living in the same house with you, then that's another matter entirely. We can be patient with a complete stranger, but it's very difficult to be patient with somebody that you've been living with for 42 years, or 60 years, or 39 years, or 10 years. Uh, and I don't know, you know, that's because we most of the time take each other for granted, I guess, uh, in, our, in our homes. That's parents take it, their children for granted, children take their parents for granted, and even within the confines of the church, individual members take other members of the church for granted too and don't count their blessings and thus be more likely to be patient with somebody that's a complete stranger than somebody who is actually a brother or sister in Christ that you worship with on a regular basis. That's not a justification. That's simply stating of a fact. Uh, and, of course, when there's a lack of patience on our part in dealing with others, then you can do things that are obviously wrong, like jump to conclusions that are not warranted by the evidence, you know, misjudging the situation, seeing a part of something happen and think you know what happened before that. And I don't know why this always comes up, but here's the way it's supposed to be in a ball game. The referee makes a call when he sees something that happens, okay? So I said, that's obvious. Well, it should be, it should be obvious, if he don't see it happen, how can he make the call? If he sees somebody laying on the floor and he didn't see how that person got on the floor, how can he call a foul on the person that's closest to him? Well, he can't. Remember, God is a fair and just God. 
He doesn't like dishonest referees or dishonest anybody. So if all if referees, regardless of what sport, if they only called what they saw happen, then you wouldn't have near as much hollering that goes on for bad calls. I don't, I don't want somebody supposing what happened right before I looked. I don't want them making a call. And, of course, nowadays maybe they're going to get to the point where they have everything on a recording, you know, where you can go back and see what happened. But you can't, what makes me madder than anything is when somebody makes a call that didn't happen. There's no way. But yet they invented it in their mind. This is what happened. Well, it's impossible for them to see something that happened when it didn't happen. So that way they become omniscient and everything else, you know, uh, in thinking that they can make a call that they did not see. You can't, you're not supposed to do that. And if you're guilty of doing that very much, then, then you all not have a job being a referee for sure, or anything else for that matter, you know. When you start trying to judge a person's motivation, that's a condemned type of judging. You can't do that. I know why he said that. How do you know he said it for that reason? Did he tell you? No, I just know. No, you don't. You, you might be right, but you might be wrong too. You cannot jump in an area where you where that ability does not exist and claim to have that ability. Too many times people start connecting dots that don't have anything to do with the picture that they're connecting dots to. And so they draw wrong conclusions based upon flimsy or false information, and then they make a whole case out of that very matter. That should not be the case with anybody that claims to be a member of the body of Christ for sure. We have to be honest, and we gotta be patient and understanding with people. Even the sorriest individual that ever lived has a soul that's more valuable than the whole world, including me and you. All right. How is patience acquired? Believe it or not, God's word, when properly used, will allow us to be patient. Remember in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, for whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning that we through patience of the scripture. My, we can look into Old Testament scripture and we see God's patience in dealing with mankind, first with the patriarchal world, then with the Mosaic age and the children of Israel, and we can see just exactly how that the God of the Old Testament is God of the New Testament, and he's patient with us. Tribulation worketh patience. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. It's in the midst of great difficulty that we're able to develop greater patience. You know, uh, the first child that's born may have the tendency to cause your patience to run small, but by the time the third one gets there, no problem at all. You know, you've seen the commercial, you know, where the the, the child being real careful with the first little baby that's born, you know, and going to give it a bath and all that, and then by the time the third, you throw them in a commode and say, get clean, boy. Yeah. Well, we'll have to pick up in an odd place right here. Go ahead and make sure and be reading on the next chapter on prejudice because we'll definitely get into that. Thank you, much. Any more books? I don't think, no. No, I'll give them all that. I, but I can make some more copies, though. I'll make some more copies. You're welcome, man.
I'm out. Going over.